feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, rumours that a snap general election could be called as early as May do persist, but Talk TV can reveal that not one major government department has been asked for manifesto ideas. Probably a good thing. Birmingham Council has voted for massive cuts to local services in the last few minutes and a record 21% hike in council tax. Plus, Labour's shadow culture secretary says singing Rural Britannia is alienating. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here at Talk TV. So apparently, singing Rural Britannia is alienating. That's according to the woman who Keir Starmer thinks should be Secretary of State for Culture in Britain. Really? I'll just take a slight pause there and take a deep breath and feel the music wash washing over me. It's Rural Britannia. How is it in any way alienating? Who gets alienated by listening to this? What sort of plank would say they don't like it? You don't feel like going out and massacring anybody, do you? You don't feel like taking over the world. You just feel warm, fuzzy. You want to go out and maybe shake hands with somebody, a kiss on the cheek, perhaps. Buy somebody a pint of Spitfire. You know, that kind of thing. For heaven's sake, it's not alienating. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Let's get the band back together. And now, Rishi Sunak's praying that Jeremy Hunt can push out a crowd-pleasing budget tomorrow as the polls predict complete electoral devastation for the Tories, but nobody seems to have a clue when that election will take place or have done any meaningful preparation for it. In fact, Talk TV can reveal that no major government departments have been asked for any election manifesto ideas, which is probably why uh, they haven't got any, because nobody's literally got a clue what to say, what to do. We'll be looking at Rishi Sunak giving an interview, a rather cringy one, uh, to Grazia magazine. But first up, I'm joined by my panel, Deputy Political Editor at the Sun, Ryan Sabi, journalist and broadcaster, Emma Wolf, and Deputy Editor of Conservative Home, Henry Hill. Very good welcome, uh, warm welcome to all of you. I mean, let's just kick it off for the, for the beginning with this real Britannia nonsense. You know, the woman who uh, Keir Starmer would like to have as Secretary of State for Culture, um, Ms Debonair, Tangam Debonair, I think it is, who was educated bizarrely in two very, very English public schools, one of which was a music school, um, apparently doesn't like it. She thinks it's alienating. You've got five years of this to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. I mean... I shall commit Harry Keery exactly right now. Exactly right. But what is it about okay. Labour that they have this kind of trouble with British culture and with British cultural sort of, I suppose, touch points? You know, Real Britannia is a pretty harmless song. It's got nothing to do with slavery. It's got everything to do with tradition. It was written hundreds of years ago. What's the problem? This is the moment where the advisors should be stepping in and say, there's a few things you probably yeah. don't touch. Last night are the problems. Yeah. Royal Britannia. Just don't, don't even go there, because right. you're going to run into an absolute roadblock, mm. and uh, you're going to get attacked from, or yeah. certainly from the Conservative side. There were several MPs out yesterday um, ha having a real sort of pop at her, and the tradition, what it, you know, the sort of the imagery yes. that it conjures, people bobbing up and down at the uh, the Royal Albert Hall on that late that Saturday evening right. in, uh, in September. Just, just leave it alone. It all stems, doesn't it, from that cellist, the guy who was at the last night of the proms, who said that it made him feel uncomfortable and he had to leave, which got him, I think, a nomination for Plank of the Week that particular week. Because, you know, if you don't like it, fine. But if you're a cellist and you're at the last night of the proms, you probably prepare yourself to possibly pay it. There is. Possibly you might be playing it at some point. Because we have to be apologetic, Mike. We cannot be... We have to be... Can't be proud. We cannot be proud. We have to be utterly fearful of being proud of anything that celebrates Britain yeah. now. We have to say sorry for that and lie on our faces in yeah. abject, you know, apology. It's just absolutely... It's mad, isn't it? Pathetic. I mean, Henry, I was, I was listening to... Not listening to, but watching the, the podcast that she said this on. She also said, apparently, that um, she was quite surprised um, at how... Uh, sort of, 
public school like the House of Commons was. And she thought that one of the things she'd like to see was a, a, a changing of the green benches because they were designed for men. And when she sits on them, her legs dangle over the side and it's all a bit uncomfortable. I, I'd missed that slightly. Mm. I'm glad I had. Thank you for yeah. thank you for telling me she said it. <laughs> she also said she also said she had to correct herself. She also said, and the food is just like school dinners, you know. I mean, like I said, she went to to private school. Yeah, it, it's a very tedious trope that's often known. You find anything about the House of Commons. Yeah. This is a new one. I'd never heard the Green Benches before. You pick anything about the House yeah, of yeah. Commons, and it it sounds like a public school, which, as you say, she went to. Right. So she'd know. So she would I mean, know. The, the interesting thing about this, though, is that is that one, the cellist's original complaint about. Well, Britannia was wrong, right? He, he, he described it as a celebration of the empire. The song predates the empire. Yeah. It's basically a Napoleonic era song, and it was a plea, you know, please rule the waves right. so that Napoleon doesn't invade. Right. But also, no one, all the people who like to complain about the Conservatives kicking off a culture war, what's this? Yeah. This is exactly what kicking off a culture war yes. looks like, right? This is, this is culture war pandering. Mm. And I think that the problem, the, one of the dangers is if Labour do enter government, they've got no money to spend, and so they will try and distract their base with nonsense yeah. like this. So as you say, Five years. Well, only yesterday. I mean, because the public school system actually seems to have become inured with all this stuff. There's some woman running Exeter School, uh, which is a private school down in, in Exeter, funnily enough. <laughs> um, and uh, she's she's getting rid of the two houses of Sir Walter Raleigh um, and and Drake. Francis and let's Drake. rename them all. Yeah. Also and, and and because you know at the, we were talking about it, and as a result, we discovered there's a Churchill statue in Prague, um, in Slovakia which is very, very much in the Czech Republic, uh, which is very, very much revered. People go and look at it. Nobody writes he was a racist on it. In this country, the, Ch the Churchill statue has to be protected by the police. That tells you what you need to know, doesn't it? Yeah, everything needs to be boarded up. The yeah. protesters, you know, run riot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, sad. it's a sad state of affairs. It, is. it really is. But I think it's because Britain is so broken now that we just think, well, let's rip it all to show. Let's get rid of Royal Britannia. Let's get rid of the green benches. Let's repaint them rainbow colours. And yeah. And if she can't reach her feet down, there are those little stools you get for potty training. Yeah. She could get one of those if that's yeah. what she wants. Yeah, I mean, God really. almighty. Well, let's maybe ask the question, why is Britain such a sorry state? Is it Rishi Sunak's fault? Um, the polling is now worse for him than ever, I think, isn't it? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, there was a poll out, the Ipsos um, poll that came out um, yesterday showed that the Conservatives were 27 points behind Labour. The Conservatives on 20%, <laughs> Labour on 47 right. And it just shows there is... There's a mounting climb. So that since that mini budget, most of the polls have shown that Conservatives are around 20 points behind. Making that back in the time that's yeah. left is going to be, it's going to be nigh on impossible. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. Well, I had uh, a, a, the, the opportunity to go through the, the Telegraph's little um, calculator thing today because they said if um, Jeremy Hunt knocks 2p off um, national insurance, you know, here's a little calculator to work out how much off you get. And if you're making £250,000 a year and you are... Um, self-employed, you say that gives you a, a generous £556. Um, and even if you're only making half that, you get the same amount. So it's worth nothing, really, to anybody who's self-employed. Yeah, and there was a pollster today, I think it was Jim Pickard, saying, in all my years of polling, never on the doorstep has anyone said to me, I'm going to change my mind based on the headline rate of national insurance. Yeah. Like, these are just a penny here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a penny more here, penny less there. You know, we'll give to you, but then we'll take it away. We'll take it away in this. Oh, but by the way, you're a second homeowner, so therefore we'll mm. have that back. This is not going to shift the polls. As Ryan right. says, 20 points behind, maybe 27 points behind. Yeah. The lowest, I think that's their lowest poll rating since 1978. I think we can have a look and see what Absolutely. that looks like in black and white, or in fact in red, blue and yellow. There we go. <laughs> Doesn't look good, does it? I mean, and people don't even like Labour and look how far ahead they are. Imagine if you're a Lib Dem as well. I mean, that's not <laughs> great news, is it? I mean, I don't think ever before have we had this many by-elections that the Lib Dems have been nowhere in. Uh, this is the thing they're constantly... They normally do they, something. This is, they are, I think they're being, they're being clever. Yeah. They know that they, if they get 9% in, you know, in Rochdale, they're, they're coming nowhere. You know, right. So what they're trying to do is concentrate on about 30 or 40 seats right. and try and win those. So actually, I think they're, they're, they're playing a sort of long game mm -hmm. and they're concentrating in the southwest, the home counties, and just try and target all their resources, mm. all their energies. I live in one of the target seats. I get bombarded. By leaflets, by do you? Them. Yeah, absolutely. They are very, very active in certain areas of the oh, country. Okay, so they're just kind of trying to see where they can get anywhere. I mean, what do you see, Henry, in, in sort of the conservative homelands? What are you hearing from people who actually would be proper conservative voters always? Not the ones that say we're never voting them again, but the ones who would be voting. What are they going to do? Well, I mean, so there's a section of them that are electorally that are flirting with Reform UK, obviously. Um, although our our panel that we survey as of long-term Conservative members. Yeah. So 
you know, the, the share of that compared to floating voters will be quite small. Right. The interesting thing for us is that today we ran, uh, we published our survey question. We decided, you know, an awful lot of times when you're looking at a budget, people are always like, well, we're going to find, uh, we're going to cut taxes and we'll pay it through efficiency savings or mm. whatever. And we're like, no, okay, we're going to ask a hard, like a hard question. Would you prefer tax cuts or more defence right. spending? This is a big debate in the Conservative Party at the minute. Three quarters of Conservative members that we surveyed preferred defence spending to tax cuts. Right. So, and, and the Treasury is not doing that. The Treasury is ruling out any... Grant Chaps, the Defence Secretary, is demanding more money for the armed forces. The Treasury is saying, no, 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 right. that's not going to happen. And so this stuff from Jeremy Hunt, it's out of step even with that hardcore Conservative mm. vote, because even if they don't want to see the money spent on X, Y, and Z, they do want to see the armed forces properly funded. Yes, and also in the background of all the migrant stuff that's going on, where we learned just a few days ago that it's not 7 million a day, it's not 10 million a day, it's 15 million a day now. You know, it's very hard, is it not, for Jeremy Hunt to say, well, we haven't got any money, because they keep finding more money to pay for the migrants. It seems like, the trouble is with the migrant thing, it seems like a bottomless pit, doesn't mm. it? They're spending, you know, I think that overall it's about four or five billion pounds yeah. a year just to pay for well, the hotels. Well, it's more than that, I think, now. And the yeah. trouble is, it really comes home to roost when you are living in one of those constituencies mm. and the, the local hotel that used to be quite a proud sort of establishment in the area is being, you know, people, migrants or asylum seekers are living there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they, 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 can't, they just kind of need to clear the backlogs right. um, and sort of make decisions one way or the other, or the other on, the, on these people's futures. Exactly yeah, right. And it's financial because we know the figures are just astronomical, mm. but it's also emotional. It's where people live. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going into your town centre and just just feeling that, oh, it's not how it and used to be. And it's not like it used to be, yeah. Yeah, and, and a feeling that, you know... And a lot that, of people feel that way about London, not yeah. just a town centre. They do, know, the they do. The main city in this country. And they're always told that they're being racist, and it's not. It's yeah. just wanting to feel at home in your home. Right. Um, yeah, I think I think people feel very, very angry about all this. I think they do. And, I mean, we saw, again, 420 migrants came over yesterday, I think, in small boats. This is in the same week that a seven-year-old girl died while trying to, to, to make the trip. So there's clearly no disincentive to come, is there? And yet we keep hearing about cracking down on people smugglers and yeah. nothing it seems to be happening. And I think that we've got to reach the total of 40,000 uh, people have come over on, on small boats mm. since Rishi Sunak has become... Uh, Prime Minister. Since state. he said he was going to stop them. So, yeah, exactly. Well, he said that, yeah, 18 months ago, and yeah. it hasn't. I mean, that, what they need to do, they, they have said, it's, you know, the Rwanda plan isn't the be-all and end-all, but they seem to be putting a lot of focus on right. it and it's not taking up a lot of parliamentary time. Yeah. What has been quite successful is these sort of bilateral deals with the likes of Albania, yeah. where the numbers have come down well, quite a There's not many lot. of those. I mean, they're, exactly, they need to... There's yeah, only that yeah. one. Well, and I'm reading got... here, today it emerged that the Rwanda flights may be delayed until the end of April because of a 30-year commemoration over genocide. I didn't know you were supposed to commemorate genocide, but I guess if you're in and, Rwanda... But they've that's made it do. the totemic thing, but the British public know that even if a single flight does take off before the end of April or whatever it is, it's going to be a couple of hundred maximum if they manage to wrestle them onto the planes. It's not going to be anything like the 40,000 who have actually landed and come here. Yeah. And, they're not even, and they're not even structuring it to maximise the deterrent effect. So, you know, what they're doing is if they manage to get Rwanda flights going, they're saying they're going to be picking people from the entire backlog, right? Yeah. Which means that the odds of you getting picked are, are minuscule. Right. What they should, more chance of winning the lottery. You? What they should do is they'll say, right, we're only going to be selecting people from people who cross after the bill becomes law. Yeah. Because that means that suddenly the odds of you getting picked are much greater and that might actually have a deterrent effect on people right. coming from France. Yeah. But, you know, if it's like, oh, okay, well, there's like 100,000 people in the backlog, like, you'll probably chance they'll that. They'll still chance walked yeah. here well, from Syria. Of years. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, no question. If they manage to get to a point where if you arrived illegally, you were immediately put on a bus, driven to an airport and put straight on a plane and flown back. That would be a that might be a deterrent. Yeah. That might actually work, you know. Yeah. But not unless you do it physically to everyone. There's a best case scenario of this the one a plane taking off or several planes taking off and taking, you know, asylum seekers, migrants over to Rwanda. The trouble is, it, the law could progress in such a way and people win their cases mm. that some people have flown back. Yeah. That's that's the trouble. Well, that's the mad thing, isn't it? I mean, just going back to the budget again for tomorrow, I mean, I'm not a great big fan of Jeremy Hunt, never have been really. I can't see that he in his delivery is going to deliver really anything. I mean, you were saying he's not he's not moving on defence. He hasn't really got much of a, uh, a sort of wiggle room on tax, really. Um, I don't know whether he's going to go for this non-dom thing, which seems completely mad to me. It looks like he'll touch something or that, he'll either scale it back or, or scrap it. But he's got to raise, you know, quite a lot of money. There isn't mm. that much headroom. Yeah. The trouble is when you start unpicking certain things, you, you go, you think back to when George Osborne was Chancellor, things start to unravel very mm. quickly, yeah. so you have to watch it. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, as you say, um, Emma, the fact that we've got this country where, you know, we can't supposedly feel proud of it, nothing seems to work in it, every time you try and do something, there's a problem, you know. There's not much hope for the Tories, really, at all, is there? There isn't. I mean, we've, we've been hearing today, oh, Rishi Sunak's not prepared for a May election. He's not prepared for any election. He's in denial about the right. election result, yeah. about this crashing defeat that is coming down the line. Mm. I think even a few months ago, we were saying, yeah, but things, something could happen. You know, things change very fast in politics. Yeah. I don't think now, and especially seeing the visual there, I think that was extremely stark. It is stark. Seeing well, that, what about and, the and I genuinely don't think that Labour are particularly popular, which is no. why I think that is so devastating. Do you Tories. guys doubt then that the Labour Galloway thing is a thing? You know, because Galloway's promising upwards of what thirty to fifty MPs. I reckon he could get somewhere in at least ten different constituencies, couldn't he? Yeah, and he could affect the result in those, yeah. in, those, in those seats as well. And he's talking about Angela Rayner's seat, mm. saying there's fifteen thousand of his supporters there. I mean, it may be the case that she still wins the seat, but it's, you know, that replicates in other seats. They could, they could lose. I'm not going to say it's going to cost them a majority, but it could certainly affect, yeah. you know, whether... Because they're not a strong enough sort of option, in my view, that if they, they, they they're, they're claiming that because they dropped their candidate, you know, there was no Labour candidate, therefore everybody moved to Galloway. I don't get, I don't think that's right. I think they went to Galloway because they went to Galloway not because of anything that Labour didn't do. It was they liked what Galloway was saying. And if he goes to those similar communities and says the same things, they'll win. Because he not only identified the Muslim vote and really talked yeah. to them, he also really identified those local issues, the maternity hospitals and the, the Primark and, yeah. the, you know, things like that that really mattered to people. Right. And Labour and the Conservatives just weren't there in Watch. So they, they let the... Yeah. He let the voters down. Yeah. And George Galloway is actually tapping into that whole levelling up thing. He yeah. said he wanted to make Rochdale great again. If the Conservatives, <laughs> after five years, again. haven't done anything again, 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 again. If um, the Conservatives haven't done anything after five years, um, you, you can see why he's trying to tap into it and make the place look better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Feel I think, better. You know, almost everyone who has seen Galloway, whether you like what he says or not, you know, he's certainly kind of livened things up a bit, hasn't he? Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why he'll he'll try and put candidates and there's talk of um, Jeremy Corbyn even teaming up with him, yeah. maybe some sort of workers' party alliance. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens on the that. The question of whether he can keep saying the things he's saying and not get arrested by somebody, I suppose. Yeah, and also, like, Galloway has, has a formid is a formidable campaigner. Even if you hate his guts, you have yeah. to admit, he, three times he's been returned to Parliament yeah. after leaving Labour at the head of some tiny party. Mm -hmm. But he has never managed, and this will be the interesting test, he's never managed to do it again. Like, with respect, didn't manage to return yeah. to second party. He didn't manage to win in Scotland when yeah. it was uh, under PR. So it's it'll be interesting to see whether or not, A, he can hold that seat at a general election, because he didn't hold Bradford West. Mm. But two, whether the kind of concentrated charisma and campaigning ability that he has can actually be replicated. And, of course, the problem, the good thing for Labour is that most of the seats, I think, where they might be exposed to a serious risk from the Workers' Party yeah. are not going to be battleground seats, right? They're not going to be seats where they're facing a Tory challenge right. or a Tory incumbent. So yeah. they could lose a lot of votes, potentially, but if they keep the seats, strategically, that doesn't matter all that much. I guess it all depends on the size of the Muslim vote and whether enough has changed because of what's happened in the Middle East. But we will come back to that. I'm also saving for you the cringy uh, Grazia interview uh, with Rishi Sunak, because I must get your view on that yeah. as well. Um, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Birmingham Council has voted just now for massive cuts to local services and a record 21% hike in council tax. Get that. And we ask why are so many Labour councils so disgracefully inept? Do not move. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning 
he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk TV. Birmingham City Councillors were locked away in a marathon meeting all day debating on the worst ever citywide budget in recent history, voting in favour of £300 million worth of cuts. Streetlights could be turned off and bin collections slashed with council tax also set to be raised by a record 21% over the next two years. It is Europe's largest local authority and declared itself effectively bankrupt last year. Talk TV hit the streets to speak to the good people of Birmingham. People are affected um, on, a, on a really basic level. I know the bins weren't collected recently and that, that was a big problem. The uh, crisis at the moment is just taking all the money out of our accounts and increasing cost of tax is just going to tip us over the edge. There's a lot of anger, especially with the uh, city going into bankruptcy of the council. Like, um, where's all the money gone? How was it spent? There's clearly not been the best management of services for quite a while so actually if anything hopefully it'll bring some innovation some change opportunity to actually sort some stuff out well it's one hell of a mess a giant mess mostly of their own making uh, joining me now councillor Marion jenkins the shadow cabinet member for value for money and efficiency on birmingham city council um and it doesn't sound to me as though the value for money and efficiency department's going terribly well Marion. sorry to uh, to bring that up uh, no, no, it's it's not. I'm actually a uh, shadow cabinet member for finance and resources. Okay. Um, but your your point well, is well, entirely I'll give you the valid. Same, I would give you the same uh, explanation, I think, for that, wouldn't I? Uh, yeah, I was going to say your point is entirely valid. Ne nevertheless, I'm afraid the council taxpayers in Birmingham have had a terrible deal uh, from this Labour administration. Um, council tax <clears throat> is going up 21% over the next two years. And that'll take it to a 77% increase um, since, since Labour took control. Uh, and throughout that time, we've seen a catalogue of, of uh, financial mismanagement culminating in the recent crisis. Yes. I mean, I've got a piece of information in front of me here, which I can scarcely believe, but you can probably um, confirm it for me. Birmingham Council has got 18 diversity-related roles at a cost of approximately £635,000 per year. Is that right? Uh, it's worse. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually uh, mentioned this in my budget speech this afternoon. The total cost of, of diversity associated things is about £900,000 a year. Right. Um, and, and I said that, you know, before we started putting council tax up 21% and before we started slashing services, we should take out that million pounds a year on diversity costs. 
And exactly how did things get this bad, though, Marion? Because, you know, it's one thing to spend a million quid on diversity roles. It's a quite another to be in the hock uh, to the uh, taxpayer or to the government or whoever, £300 million. Yeah. So, yes, in, in, indeed. So, <clears throat> um, for all the time I've been a councillor, there have been numerous um, fa financial failings, but the things that have pushed it over the edge just recently... Uh, two things in particular, that there's been the disastrous equal pay claims, um, which have created a liability of about £800 million. Um, no one knows what, what the final figure is, but it's, it's a very large number. And that could have been avoided if Labour had taken steps that we have advised back in 2017. And the other thing is the disastrous failure to implement a new accounting system. Yes. Um, but when going to cost 20 million the cost now is in excess of 100 million and, and we're still in a position where the officers can't get reliable financial information out of the accounting system so when you put all you put those two things together on top of the fact that we'd already failed to achieve 80 million in savings last year uh, the council essentially went bankrupt um uh, I, I mean, obviously, local authorities don't go bankrupt in the conventional sense, but it, right. it, 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 it helps to explain what we mean. And the consequence of that is they issue what they call a Section 114 notice, which basically says the council is bankrupt. And from what you were watching, if you were able to watch some of the people speaking to us uh, just before we came to you, a lot of people in Birmingham are saying that services haven't been very good for quite a long time. So it's not as if they've been pushing out the boat and spending bucket loads of money on the public. Um, no, no, I mean, a, a number of the services have been very poor. Um, waste collection, you know, which I think most people would regard as a core council service, yes. has been very patchy all the time that, that I've been a councillor. And it was the problems with waste collection that triggered the equal pay issue in the sense that the council was um, give, giving privileges to, to the bin men. And, and because of Blair era um, equal pay legislation, it meant that comparisons could be made between the bin men and people in entirely different jobs. And as a consequence of that, we're now going to have to pay a windfall to the people in, in the entirely different jobs. And that's going to be partly funded by 600 redundancies of a group of workers in yet another group. So, so but, but all this could have been avoided, Mike, if Labour had taken fairly rudimentary administrative steps to put in place a pay grading scheme when we raised this danger back in 2017. Yes, exactly right. And is anybody taking uh, the sort of responsibility for this? Is there anybody carrying the can? Is there anybody who lose their job in senior management as opposed to just making people redundant? Um, the the Labour administration um, make... Uh, they, they will say they are sorry, but yet in, in the same... Uh, speech, they then go on to blame the government and they'll say it's because the government isn't giving them enough money. But but the point there really is that, you know, th there's hardly a family, there's not a worker in Birmingham that wouldn't like more money. We all think our employer should pay us more. Mm. And, and we may be right, but in the end, we all have to operate within the budget that we have. And in Birmingham, the administration have failed to do that. They've been given so much public money They've mismanaged it and they fail to operate the, 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 the council with the money they have available, which is what every other family in Birmingham, of course, has yeah. to do. Exactly right. And if, I don't know if you know the, the answer to this one, but what is the average council tax bill right now in Birmingham and, and what will it go up to? The, the average council tax bill is going to be pushing on £2,000. Um, I can, I can, and I can, I, I can, t I can tell you that I, I mean, I'm a Birmingham council taxpayer, and I've seen mine going up, as I say, 77 percent over the course of the next 10 years. Yeah, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, and so, when will these sort of cuts begin? I mean, when will you suddenly find yourself walking down a street in Birmingham and there's no street lights and it's all a bit dark and horrible? Well, that's, uh, that's another good good point. I mean, they have known about this situation for at least seven months, because it was back in the last summer when it became obvious that the council was going to become bankrupted. It's taken them since last July, at least last July, probably longer, to produce the budget, which should set out the savings that need to be made. And this budget was only published five days ago. And they need to make 300 million in savings. So that's 300 million each year off the current account. They haven't managed to, to identify 300 million savings. They've only done about half of that. 
So they still don't even know where all these savings are going to come from, even though they're now in the process of selling off assets and making arrangements to borrow money from the government at premium rates to plug the gap. So even now, they haven't produced a proper budget. You know, in, in the real commercial world, if a company had found itself in this position, you'd be seeing these cost-cutting measures coming into effect very quickly. But Labour have allowed seven months to go by without properly implementing the savings that need to be done with the sense of urgency that people that you and I would expect. Yes, exactly right. And you probably would have sacked the board and the CEO as well, meaning all the Labour councillors as well. But there we are. Uh, Marion, thanks very much for talking to us. Marion Jenkins there giving us a heads up on what's likely to be coming down the pipe if you live in Birmingham. And it ain't pretty. And it's going to be coming in the dark as well because you won't have any streetlights. And it's going to be filthy because nobody's going to pick up your rubbish either. What an absolute nightmare. Ridiculous. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham, Princess of Wales first scheduled engagement following her surgery has been announced, but not by the palace. We'll be discussing more after the break. See you in a jiffy. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. The Princess of Wales is set for her eagerly anticipated royal return following an announcement this morning that she'll be appearing at the Trooping of the Colour in June. The news comes after Kate Middleton was snapped by paparazzi driving with her mother in Windsor following weeks of online rumours and conspiracy theories about her whereabouts and well-being. Joining us now is Talk TV's Royal Editor, Sarah Houston. Sarah, very good evening. Welcome to uh, the world of the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, it's fascinating, this, isn't it? Because it turns out that the MOD, of all people, which is supposed to be the kind of, you know, 
um, the protector of our realm and the, uh, the, the people that we turn to when things need to be carefully handled have let something slip that they shouldn't have let slip. Yeah, evening to you, Mike. Good to see you. Yes, so there was a big flurry of excitement earlier when it was announced by the Ministry of Defence that the Princess of Wales was going to be inspecting uh, the Trooping the Colour Parade on June the 8th. They announced three parades, uh, one to be inspected by the Princess of Wales and the last one, the 15th of June, the Big King's Birthday Parade, mm. to be inspected by the King himself. It appears they got a little bit ahead of themselves. It was meant to be there so that people could buy tickets and let them know what the diary events are, but those events haven't been confirmed by Kensington Palace or Buckingham Palace. And Kensington Palace pretty quick to say, look, it's only us that confirms the diary of the Princess of Wales, and we haven't done that yet. Right. We're expecting to see her long before June the 8th, though, Mike. You know, we're still told that she's going to be off until after Easter. It's not clear whether that means Easter weekend or whether she's going to remain off the rest of the Easter holidays yeah. and then back to work when the children go back to school. We haven't had an update on that, but, you know, that's way before June the 8th. And I think we would hope and expect to see her back to work before then. Well, that's it, because Easter's early this year, isn't it? It's at the end of March, so it could well be that, you know, in the first week of April, suddenly she makes some kind of appearance. But you would imagine, after the seriousness of whatever it is that's happened to her, they would want to make that decision closer to the time. They wouldn't necessarily want to make any bookings that far in advance, would they? I think that's precisely the point, because they don't want to then have to deal with the kind of headlines if they do pull out at the last minute. Just look what happened last week when Prince William was a last minute no show at his godfather's memorial service. And that then led to so many questions. Well, what's happening? Is, is Kate unwell again? Is it the king, for example? There have been more than enough conspiracy theories already about the Princess of Wales and her health. And so I think they are taking the, the less said the better mm. approach and only confirming engagements when they really know that they can go on. Right. But, of course, now we have this other sort of slight difficulty with this TMZ picture which has appeared. I'm just yeah. looking at it now. I know we're not supposed to be uh, publishing it in this country. We've made an agreement not to do that. But it is available for people to see um, over in America and on various different websites and online or whatever. Um, you know, I'm wondering whether some people have said this is a good thing for her because it means that people have now seen her. So all these people who were kind of getting worked up into all sorts of a, uh, of a, a stramash saying, oh, what's happened to her? Why haven't we seen her? Well, now you have seen her, very possibly. Yeah, that was my first reaction when I saw it yesterday, Mike, was this photograph, which, as you say, was published on a US website, hasn't been published in the UK. UK broadcasters and UK newspapers are not showing it out of respect for the Princess of Wales. We've been asked to respect her privacy during her period of recuperation. And actually, a lot has changed since the death of Princess Diana. An agreement was made that paparazzi photographs, and that's what this is, of members of the royal family during their private time wouldn't be used. I'm not sure that's always been the case, but if a, a really good uh, public interest case can't be made, then they're to be avoided. Uh, and this was taken by a paparazzi photographer yesterday uh, in Windsor, uh, Kate being driven by her mum just after nine o'clock in the morning, so we can assume that they may have been out on the, the school run. We can talk about it, but we're not showing it for that reason. Look, my first reaction was that this might silence some of those conspiracy theories which have been wild. I mean, some of them darkly humorous, but some of them pretty sinister, yeah. actually, suggesting that the Princess of Wales had gone missing. Uh, and um, I, I thought this was going to silence them. And, th and then you go back down the rabbit hole and you see the conspiracy theories are still there and they've got renewed energy uh, today, suggesting perhaps this photograph might have been staged and that it wasn't even taken yesterday, all kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, these kind of theories used to take place on the fringes of society, uh, didn't they, Mike? But social media has allowed them to gain momentum and, and end up spilling into the mainstream. And that's very, very difficult for Kensington Palace to yeah. respond to. Uh, and they're certainly trying to avoid that at this stage. Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? Because it's so tribal, particularly on Twitter, where you've got the sort of supporters of the Meghan Markle side of the family uh, and the supporters of, of uh, Prince and Princess of Wales. And they're constantly going at each other. Uh, it's quite unedifying, really. It's pretty awful. 
yeah, it's it's really awful, and you really can go down a rabbit hole. And once you've seen one thing or clicked on one post, then it keeps feeding you uh, those that same kind of content. Such is the algorithm, yeah. and it is pretty distressing. And and you mentioned Meghan and Harry, and they've been on the receiving end of these yeah. kind of conspiracy theories for so many years. And again, they are wild uh, conspiracy theories, suggesting that you know Meghan never actually was pregnant. For example, there are so many. Uh, bizarre and damaging uh, theories that are put out there on social media but do seem to get traction and that is what is so difficult uh, about social media is being able to navigate that and actually just try and ignore it that's what the royals are trying to do now is just say look this is the madness of social media we're not going to change our policy our statement remains the same. The Princess of Wales is at home recovering. That's what she's going to be doing until at least Easter. Yes, and they did try saying that, but obviously people weren't willing to put up with it or buy it. Meghan, meanwhile, we're told, is going to take part in some International Women's Day panel uh, with Brooke Shields and a couple of other interesting characters. Yes, so we had the announcement that Megan is taking part in a panel at a festival called SXSW South by Southwest. It's taking place on Friday, which is International Women's Day. She's going to be sitting on the panel alongside the actress Brooke Shields, who you mentioned, but also uh, the US journalist and broadcaster Katie Couric. And she's going to be discussing the representation of women in the media and entertainment. And, and just looking at the, the biog introducing her, they say that she is a uh, feminist and champion of human rights and gender equity, New York Times best-selling author and co-founder of the Archwell Foundation. She's uh, the first name on the list. She's headlining this panel. It will certainly be interesting to see what she has to say about some of those issues when she's sitting there on that panel. Uh, but when you read her bio, you can see certainly how she is channeling herself. She's yes. under new management. We're, we've been told there's set to be a rebrand. Certainly these avenues are ones that she'd like to pursue. Yes, exactly right. And meanwhile, finally, King Charles reparations, the Commonwealth, you know, the story that won't go away, really, and nobody can seemingly uh, figure out where it's all going to end. Well, it's not going to end and it's not going to go away, is it, uh, Mike? Because those calls for an apology and for reparations for uh, Britain's role in the international transatlantic slave trade are getting louder and louder and they can't ignore them. Any visit that a member of the royal family undertakes to a former colony, those questions are being asked and they're being asked loudly. I get the sense that the king doesn't want to ignore them either. I think we've certainly had a shift and more engagement on this from this new era than we did from the late queen. We're told that the king uh, has is giving his support to an independent research project uh, on uh, the British monarchy's involvement in slavery. He has addressed it previously uh, on visits to Rwanda, to Barbados. He also talked about the historic wrongs of the past when he was in Kenya uh, last year as well. He's expressed profound sorrow and his deep distress. What he hasn't done is said sorry. And uh, why is sorry the hardest word for them? As the head of state, he has to tow the government party line and it's not government policy to apologise. Rishi Sunak says it's not helpful to go back over the past. We need to think about the future. Uh, and so it's a very difficult one uh, for the king to navigate. I don't know whether there's any nuance between him being able potentially to apologise for his own family's personal involvement in the slave trade or whether that then uh, gets him too involved in in politics uh, as well but certainly other aristocratic families are doing it the trevelyan family uh, one of the latest one other monarchs are doing it as well the king of the netherlands has apologized for his country's uh, involvement in the slave trade and if the king were to speak out on an issue like this well it would have huge implications, wouldn't it? He could be a real architect for change. But at this stage, the uh, the word sorry is one that they're just not able to yeah. utter. Yeah, and I think part of the reason for that, Sarah, is that if they say sorry, 
then it then follows that they may have to pay reparations on top of the sorry, um, which of course would have to come not out of the king's money, uh, but out of taxpayers' funds. So I think that's part of the problem as well. So, but I'm sure we'll be talking about it again uh, soon because it's not going to go away, as you say, and nobody's going to say sorry as of yet. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham. After the break, the Tories are divided again over spree, free speech containment, and apparently singing Rule Britannia is, of course, alienating. Stay right there. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. Now, what is it about Labour MPs and their supporters? Why do so many of them have to make it clear that they don't really appreciate our history, our culture and our way of life? Sir Keir Starmer has tried desperately to drag his party away from the socialist swamp of self-abuse. He's tried desperately to prove that he and his tribe love the union flag just as much as everyone else. And he's always banging on about how much he loves this country. But sadly, there are still plenty of people in Labour that give the lie to all of that. Take the former Labour candidate in Rochdale, who was unceremoniously dumped by Starmer, although it took him two days to do it, when it was revealed he'd made some hideous anti-Semitic remarks on more than one occasion. Take Jeremy Corbyn, still a member of the party, despite never having changed his views on all manner of subjects which Starmer would now regard as unacceptable. Take the dozens of backbench MPs who regularly have a go at Britain and do its culture in on a regular basis on social media. And today, take the Labour Shadow Culture Secretary, Tangam Debonair. She's decided it was a good time to question whether Rule Britannia really is a stirring patriotic anthem conjuring up images of Britain's long and proud history. Wrong. 
She said it can feel alienating to others. Wrong. She said culture should be accessible to everyone. Well, it is, for heaven's sake. Who are these people, she refers to? I hear you ask. Well, one of them is the rather self-indulgent young musician Sheku Kane Mason. Remember him? He's the cellist that said playing Rule Britannia would make Britons feel uncomfortable. He was so upset he had to walk out of a concert in case he got too triggered. What a plank. He actually made it onto Plank of the Week as a result. Miss Debonair, herself a product of English public schools, reckons a lot of people would agree with him. Which people does she mean? I mean, why won't she just say it out loud? I don't know anyone that feels uncomfortable on hearing Rule Britannia. In fact, if anything, everyone I know generally joins in whenever they hear it. I mean, who could fail to be inspired by that song? I mean, seriously, I'm not even going to bother explaining the history of the tune, the meaning of the words or the significance of dance uh, or the feeling of being patriotic, because anyone who doesn't get it can get stuffed. I don't care if you don't like it. And guess what? I don't give a toss if it makes you feel uncomfortable either. Tune pip. And now, another vexation for Rishi Sunak. His plans to curtail Islamist organisations and hate preachers by broadening the definition of extremism risks ensnaring unrelated rights groups. So, is this a welcome plan of action or a threat to free speech in Britain? I'm rejoined by Deputy Political Editor of the Sun, Ryan Saby. Ryan, um, they've got themselves into a real kind of quagmire here, haven't they? Because everybody who talks about freedom of speech says there's plenty of rules in place they can easily control these hate preachers. They've done it in the past when they've wanted to. They've banned people from coming here from other countries when they've wanted to. And they've kicked people out when they've wanted to. So why are they getting themselves in this muddle? No, exactly. And I think one of the problems is that um, one of the definitions they're trying to come up with is whether this undermines or overturns British values. Right. And some would argue that the Scottish National Party would, 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 would come into this. Now, right. I mean, that is, that is very, very extreme. Right. But it just means where do you draw the line? Right. So I think there is this really difficult and this question and answer session going on in government at the moment about how broad does that definition mm. go? And that's why it's ta it's, you know, this d decision is meant to be out in the next uh, few weeks or so. But yes. it's, it's, that's just why ministers are scratching their heads over it. And is it being kind of looked upon as a method by which to stop the marches? Is that kind of what they're trying to do? I think there's a little bit of that, but I think that the things are getting slightly sort of conjoined, uh, sort of confused slightly over this, in that, that Rishi Sunak, I think what he was trying to get to was not only is the sort of the overview of the, the hate marches and, and what people were saying, but actually the individual MPs that, you know, are being targeted, yeah. the, the council leaders, and they should not sort of undermine our democracy. So I think, that's one of the things that Rishi Sunak was was trying to get to, yeah. and that that kind of mob rule aspect. Right. So, because we saw a terrible uh, tweet today, didn't we? Andrew Jenkins published it that somebody had sent her. Yeah. Not clear who it came from. Hopefully, the police are going to get involved and, and hopefully find whoever it wasn't sent it. But a really nasty, horrible uh, tweet in, involving threats to her child and all sorts of other things. And I'm sure that many MPs would would show you similar stuff that they get as well. Um, but it seems to me that, once again, Rishi Sunak made the big speech grandstanding outside Downing Street on Friday. But, you know, is he actually going to do anything? Well, this is the trouble. I think when you looked at that speech, there was, there was, la there was plenty of, I'd say, language in there. Mm. He talked, you know, it, it was a, a, a very well-written written piece. But yeah. the trouble is, what was the action? Right. What was the, the you know, call, he'd spoken to the police chiefs earlier in the week, but actually in that speech, was there any sort of new mm. policy in there. He said, I'll back the police. But the trouble is, eh, of course he's going to back mm. the police on, on, on whatever they do right. in, in doing this, if they're going to be sort of a bit more hardline and, uh, and do what he says. But uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, especially on that, that, that broad definition of extreme. But also the genie's out of the bottle, isn't it? Because it's all very well saying to these marching, you know, thousands, well, you can't do it anymore. But what do you think is going to happen then? You think they're just going to go, oh, well, we won't bother. Well, they're going to turn up in their thousands and the police are going to go, there's too many of them, there's more of them than there are of us, and they're going to do nothing. No, absolutely. And when he made that speech, you just felt that all those people, those protesters, those demonstrators who've been forever marching, you know, it's, yeah. you, know you have that right to protest and mm. demonstrate in this country. They, they turned around and said, well, it's, it's not going to stop us. Right. So I think that's why he's trying to make the point that, you know, there, there should be sort of harsher... Uh, punishments handed out to people who do target mm. MPs. I mean, just the other day I saw a video of Just Stop Oil and one of their protesters actually turning up outside Keir Starmer's house. Yes, I saw um, that. And then you had the, the comments from Chris Packham. Putting Packen. something through the letterbox yeah, or something absolutely. Like that. Then you yeah. had Chris Packham, um, the environmentalist, he was uh, talking this week of how you could 
demonstrate outside an MP's house, but obviously if it's, if it's peaceful. Yeah. The trouble is, do we really want those people, go anyone going outside an MP's house? Yeah, I don't think that's right. You have to draw the line somewhere. I don't think that's right, but equally, do you want somebody who suggests that being arrested and dragged into a cell because you call him an extremist? Yeah, no, it's not, uh, yeah. I mean, Chris Packham is many things. I don't think he's an extremist. No, uh, absolutely. I he, think he's a bit of an idiot, but, you know, that's that's not an arrestable offence yet in this country. Yeah, and he believes strongly in what he does, but how, how far do, can these people push it? And how yeah. far do you want to push them every time just mm. to sort of coax them along? And looking at some of the various different organisations which governments, and particularly local governments, have been involved with, the Muslim Council of Britain, Palestine Action, Muslim Engagement and Development, who I'm pretty sure are the people that Baroness Vorsi has mentioned in the past as kind of framing... The, the, the definition of Islamophobia. You know, these are all groups that are quite well embedded into things like the Metropolitan Police. You know, they go to them for advice. Yeah. You know, now you're going to be saying, all right, you can't go to these groups. I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but they would literally have to completely change root and branch how public sector operations operate. Yeah, um, the Ministry of Defence, you know, uh, yeah. are, are linked to these, you know, these, uh, these organisations. Um, it's, it's basically, you'd have to you know, go through every single sort of contract or yeah. written agreement that you have with these and, and sort of rip it up and start again. Well, what about, I mean, we talked about George Galloway uh, earlier on today. What about his organisation, you know, the Workers' Party of Britain? You know, Chris Williamson has already been, I think, questioned by the police about some of the things he said on, on election night in Rochdale and, and things that he said since. I mean, he looks like an extremist to me. It also brings up the question on public money yeah. and whether if someone is connected or convicted or, or, or is, is spoken to by the police or arrested, those MPs who do go to Westminster, do, do they actually still receive that that, that, that public funding? It's a, yes. you, know, you know, you could have hundreds of thousands of pounds going, mm. going to them. So what's the actual process at the moment then? Are they trying to draw up some form of this? So, so, so Michael Gove is actually trying to come up with this definition and I think as a result of that, you'll then have a subsection of a number of mm. organisations. I mean, this could run to this hundreds of... Uh, or, you know, prescribed of, extremist organisations. Pres not prescribed is, is at the, the top end of it. Right. But there will certainly be um, a list of, you know, as I say, it could be dozens, it could be hundreds, yeah. depends how many are there around the country they feel, you know, have come within that broad definition. Yeah. Sounds like an absolute nightmare. It is a, it is a minefield. Yeah, absolutely. Ryan, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Ryan will be back in the next hour. We'll have a look at what's going on in the papers and much else besides. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. In the next hour, we look at Trump's run for the White House because it's Super Tuesday. Plus, the frozen assets of Chelsea billionaire's former owner. Stay tuned. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, the race for the White House hots up with its biggest day so far. 15 states and one US territory are choosing their candidates for president. Meanwhile, Ukrainian war victims are still waiting for billions of pounds promised to them after the forced sale of Chelsea Football Club. And Britain is beaten by only one nation for the title of this, the world's most miserable country. They never seem to learn, do they? Big corporations, usually American, hooking themselves up with weird personalities, thinking that going woke won't make them go broke. You might remember the saga of Dylan Mulvaney, the trans woman who was accused of mocking women when he was signed up by Bud Light to sell beer last year. The entire charade blew up because Dylan was so clearly making fun of actual women when he posted a video to promote a giveaway from the beer company, a can with what they called her face on it to celebrate his sex change. Unfortunately for Budweiser, the advert turned out to be one of the worst ideas they had ever had. Ordinary customers revolted and some celebrities even retaliated. Kid Rock and several other celebs filmed themselves shooting cans of the offending beer. And the result? Parent company Anheuser-Busch lost $400 million in sales thanks to a boycott. And that's a 13.5% slump. Mulvaney then added insult to corporate injury when he was hired by Nike to make a frankly insulting video where he was pretending to work out in Nike clothes, including a sports bra in what looked like more of a parody of a woman than a real one. Real women, of course, were not happy. And now Nike has had to make hundreds of people redundant. Well, I'm sorry to report that not everyone has learned that particular lesson. Welcome to the stage, Doritos, the Spanish version. Owned by PepsiCo Spain, they have just got into bed, as it were, with a trans influencer to sell their crisps. And they're already being slammed as the new Bud Light, so it hasn't started well. Doritos have signed up 24-year-old Samantha Hudson, who claims to be a singer and activist in Spain with 30,000 followers on YouTube. Samantha's real name is Ivan Gonzalez Ranido, and he identifies as anti-capitalist and Marxist, so presumably he won't be taking any money. It gets worse, though. Ranido said in one video that he is for the abolition of and to destroy and annihilate the traditional monogamous nuclear family. And as a teenager, he also tweeted about wanting to do thuggish things to a minor. Great, isn't it? These are the role models that corporate America thinks should be employed to sell snacks to our children. There are numerous other examples of crass and sexual behaviour from Renato, often in front of children, and he's regularly mocked victims of sexual assault as well. We can only hope that in this case, go woke, go broke, is actually a wish. Now, coming up later on the show, we'll bring you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. And I think for a lot of people, one of the most amazing stories they've seen uh, all day today. But if you haven't seen it yet, it's all about a grandmother who was left dangling upside down, seven feet in the air, when she got caught in her local shop's electric shutters. She said, it could only happen to me. We've actually got some CCTV footage of the incident itself. This has now been viewed something like two million times already on YouTube. As you can see, she was actually waiting to go inside and clean it, and the poor woman got stuck. 
But the great thing is, she's hanging on to her shopping bag. She's not letting go of it. She's never letting go of it. Fortunately, the shop owner came out. His name is Ahmed, and he managed to unhook her and bring her down. This all happened in Pontypridd in South Wales. And in true South Walian tradition, when she was asked how she felt about it, she said, flip it, Eck. It could only happen to me. And it's right. It could only happen to her. But what a woman. Uh, her name is Anne. She's gone viral. Anne Hughes, 71 years of age, absolutely brilliant. And um, Ahmed Akram rushed outside the Best One store in Tonteg near Pontypridd uh, and basically said he rescued her. She said, I hung on to my shopping trolley even though it was empty. I had to cling on to something. So, absolutely brilliant. Um, something to cheer you up in these dark days. And let's face it, we certainly need a bit of cheering up. We'll bring you more from the papers coming up a little bit later on. The panel will be back, of course, as well. But let's go over to the United States of America now because 16 states and one US territory are casting their ballots on what they call Super Tuesday. The results of today's vote will determine the two major parties' presidential candidates ahead of the November election. And for more, let's cross the former presidential candidate, the man himself, Mr Joe Walsh. Joe, very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic. Michael, my friend, good to be with you. Now, I've seen a few Super Tuesdays in my time. I think this one couldn't be less super, to be honest, because, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion what's going to happen, isn't it? Go, uh, Michael, go watch your favourite movie tonight. Go watch <laughs> TV, read your, read your favourite book. Uh, there's no story here. I wish I could bring you news. It, th look, this is going to be Trump versus Biden. Donald Trump was always going to be the Republican Party nominee from the very beginning, Yeah. period. Uh, it'll become official maybe in the next, maybe this week, maybe next, but it's his. And, I mean, as far as the, um, uh, the, the, the nominations go, I suppose the only exciting thing about Donald Trump is who he might pick as his running mate. When does he have to do that? He doesn't have to pick his running mate until the convention in the summer. Um, you know I'm no fan of Trump, Michael, but uh, he is a pretty good marketer. I'll give him that. And so I would expect Trump may come out sometime in the next month or two and pick his VP. Yeah. I, I, I think he'll pick a woman. If he were smart, he'd pick a woman. But I think he'll do it. Yeah, I mean, I've heard he's looking at the Texan governor as well. Um, he was down in Texas recently because of all the deportations and the arrivals and the nastiness going on down there on the border. It's obviously quite a hot part of the country. Yeah, look, Michael, you know, you and I disagree on Trump, but one, one political thing that we'd agree on, Donald Trump has a problem, more of a problem with women voters, yeah. especially women voters who live in the suburbs. Uh, it would go a long way to help him if he picked uh, a, a female VP. This is going to be a really close election. I'll be honest with you. If the election were held tomorrow, Trump would win. Joe Biden's got a lot of work to do. I think it's important that Trump does, because remember, Michael, Donald Trump will only serve one term if he wins, unless, of course, he tries to stay in office. Yes, of course. One story that I wanted to ask you about, which I saw just earlier before we came on air, is a story that I've seen in the US running currently, which says the Biden administration has admitted that it secretly flew 320,000 asylum seekers into the US last year in order to reduce numbers at the border. Have you seen anything on that? Yeah, I did. I did see that. And it's a huge problem. And I will say the Trump administration did the same thing. And the Biden, excuse me, the Obama administration did before when presidents don't want there to be to be big log jams at the border because it looks bad. They'll put them on planes, trains, automobiles, you name it. Look, Michael, this is a horrible issue for Biden. Our border is a crisis. Joe Biden is largely responsible for it. Um, I expect him, Michael, to come out Thursday at the State of the Union and announce a couple tough actions that he might do on his own at the border. Right. And what do you make of Kamala Harris's kind of appearance this week, where she, where she looked as though she was attempting to kind of make everybody remember who she was? I spoke to um, uh, a, a guy over there uh, just the other day who I said, you know, the funny thing about Kamala Harris is I've heard her voice so rarely, I wasn't even sure it was her. It's going to change, Michael. That's going to change because, look, Trump and Republicans are going to run against her. 
Um, Trump and Republicans are going to say that Joe Biden, if he wins, he won't serve four years. He'll be 86. He won't make it. So really, we're running against Vice President Harris. So I think Republicans are going to do a lot of this. I think the Biden team, Michael, has decided we're going to put her out there and we're going to put her in situations where she can look good to try to combat that. Yes. Now, I've got to ask you about another story as well. I'm sure you'd like this one. This is the story that's in the Rolling Stone magazine about all the drugs that were apparently being taken during the Trump administration. There's no suggestion that he was taking them, but they're saying that inside the White House, there was Xanax, there was speed doing the rounds. I mean, the only thing I would say is that if he was on speed, he wouldn't want to eat all those cheeseburgers, surely, at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. No, I, that's the one thing we know about Trump. I don't think he I don't think he drinks and I don't think he does drugs. Look, Michael, I just started watching two weeks ago House of Cards. I had never seen it. Really? Great show. I, yeah, I can't. Uh, and again, I'm a former congressman. You work on the Hill. You work on Capitol Hill or you work in the White House. Uh, I, I don't know enough about this story, but these are crazy environments. I would imagine that many of these staffers are p potentially taking things maybe they shouldn't be taking. These yeah. are crazy environments. Yeah, well, we know they found some cocaine uh, that Hunter Biden left in the Biden White House, but, I mean, that's Ah, uh, you don't know that, Michael. You don't know it was Hunter well, Biden's... they found it uh, the weekend after he'd been there, right? That was how they found it. Ah, uh, look at you. Look at you <laughs> starting something again. Look no, at I'm not. you. I'm honestly not. The other the other thing that I was going to ask you about, of course, is, is that under the whole kind of... Um, administrative rules. You would think people would be having drug tests all over the place, wouldn't they? Random drug tests to make sure they're not actually taking too many drugs? Yes, they should. And I don't know why, Michael. It seems like we've abandoned that. Yeah. Uh, even late in the Trump administration. I don't know if that goes on now. Uh, absolutely, there should be random drug tests. These people are working in the White House. Yeah. They're working right next door to the president. We need to know that. Absolutely. And on the House of Cards front, you should look at the English version of the House of Cards because, you know, it was written... What is it? it? It's called the House of Cards, but it was written... It was a BBC um, show, which because it was written by a former advisor to Margaret Thatcher. So it's, it's, it was originally written oh, around... Oh, Michael, the I British... want to watch that. Yeah, it's a great show. It really is. And it's not, it's not... It hasn't got Kevin Spacey in it, but it's got a couple of very, very famous English actors in it, so I would highly recommend it. Oh, let me Let fantastic. me finish. I'm going to watch. Me, let me finish up with your tweet from today about an incredibly ridiculous story. You know me, I'm all against the wokists in this country, in this, in this world. Um, and the famous picture, which I think we can show, uh, of the VE Day oh. kiss, right? What, a, what an iconic picture, fantastic picture. Now, surely you're going to tell me this isn't true. The Department of Veterans Affairs have just banned this picture. Have they gone mad? So I got bad news and good news, Michael. Look right. at that picture. Yeah. VJ Day, 1945, August 45. Whoa! Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs sent out a memo earlier today banning that picture because they thought it was politically incorrect. Because, you know, Michael, that sailor did not know that nurse. That was just a spontaneous kiss. And the, the Department of Veterans Affairs thought that would be inappropriate today. Right. The good news is the secretary... So much crap came out on, on social media about this. Yeah. The secretary of the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs reinstated that picture, so yes. it will not be banned. Well, you might have said to them as well, if you were having to make the argument, well, it was quite inappropriate for the Japanese to bomb Pearl Harbor as well. You know, Thank you. And maybe when you actually want to react to something like that being all over and you can actually celebrate life again, you might feel like kissing a stranger in Times Square. No, oh, Michael, woke, you and I share that. Wokeness, man. Wokeness is going to kill us. All this political correct bull crap is going to kill us. Yeah, I'm glad we can finally... We can always end up on an agreeing, on an agreement, Joe, you know? I know you get... I bit... like it when we fight. I like it more when we fight. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, once we've got Trump versus Biden official, we'll have a big fight, yes. I'm sure. That's going to happen. Thank you. Great to see you. Joe Walsh, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Michael. Uh, very sensible man. Uh, used to be more sensible, of course, when he was less uh, anti-Trump. But that's another story. We'll have some more on him and all of that coming up shortly. Now, moving on, it's time to come clean. Chelsea Football Club needs a liquidator. Yes, the club's scar anthem, the liquidator by the Harry J All-Stars, couldn't be more relevant, despite the 2022 craze of freezing Russian assets after the invasion of Ukraine. No money seized from former Chelsea owner Roman Abramovich has actually been sent to Kyiv. 
Joining me now is Henry Jackson Society Executive Director, Dr Alan Mendoza. Alan, welcome to the Independent Republic, Mike Graham. Nice Hello, to see you. Mike. Um, the funny thing about all of these stories about seizing assets and, you know, clamping down on, on Russian oligarchs and all of that is it's quite interesting when you follow up some time later to go, <laughs> did anything actually happen? And it turns out nothing's actually happened. Tell us the story. Well, this is quite extraordinary because uh, Mr. Bambush, as part of the sale of Chelsea, uh, basically said that he would give £2 billion of that to uh, the Ukrainian um, refugee... Oh, sorry, the, the victims, victims of the war. Mm. Now, originally, that was obviously thought, oh, he must mean the victims in Ukraine who were uh, the victims of Russian aggression. Yes. But there's now been a bit of an argy-bargy about that because um, he's apparently suggesting, well, it could be Russian victims of the war as well. Yes. And so there's a question about, well, can the money be uh, unfrozen? It needs his consent. Uh, can it be taken without his consent? If he gives his consent, does he have to tell us where it goes? And you could have this remarkable situation where the money earmarked for Ukrainian um, war victims get sent by Mr Abramovich to Russia. Yes. And where is he at the moment? Because there was a point at which I think he was trying to get into Israel, couldn't do it. Um, nobody really was terribly sure where he went after that. Where is he? I genuinely don't know, but um, there are people who track Roman Abramovich mm. on a on a regular basis. They look at his planes and they yeah. see where he goes. Has I he mean, still got his big yacht? He's got all sorts of goodies in different places. Yeah. I would imagine that he's using Russia as a base right now, right. given where he is, but but also moving some of his other properties where he uh, doesn't feel that he's in danger. Because was he not at the very start of the Ukraine war, sort of doing some kind of peace envoy type role as well, kind of travelling between... Paris and Moscow, trying to see if there's some, some deal could be reached. Yes, again, and this goes back to my point about people tracking him. So yeah. you saw his planes going this way and that way. He was cropping up in negotiations. There was even the, a suggestion he'd been poisoned at one right. point. He and a Ukrainian had been poisoned at these negotiations, trying to bring some kind of resolution. But all it tells you is that he, he was very close, maybe still is very close to Vladimir Putin, right. which is why he was targeted by the government. Yes, here. and when the club was sold, it was sold to a group of Americans who now have no connection at all. To, to Abramovich or Abramovich, whichever way you wish to say it. Uh, and that money presumably is somewhere, but where is it? Well, it's frozen. So, so frozen where, though? Well, part of it's gone to this foundation. I think it was actually two and a half billion, not two, um, that, that has been sort of set up to essentially distribute this money. And, mm. and of course, it has discovered that it can't distribute the money because there's no legal mechanism to get the money. Right. As to the rest, who knows? But in general terms, let's just look generally for a second. There is some, you know, 200 to 300 billion uh, euros, pounds that, that's actually frozen of Russian state assets, yes. let alone oligarchs' assets in this way. Mm. And those also are sitting there waiting for someone to decide what to do with them. These are things obviously owned by the Russian state yes. as opposed to individuals. And, and again, we have the same problem there. So who's responsible for kind of watching over it, if you like? Because obviously with the fertile imagination that I've got, I'm thinking there's somebody stealing this money, you know, like something out of Ocean's Eleven, you know, coming up from underneath the vault and if it's gold, just taking it all away. Well, well fortunately, this money uh, tends to be in a sort of digitised form, digitized rather, yes, form rather than you know, huge vaults of cash that's, yeah. that's out there. But but look, it's, the banking system has frozen it, essentially. We know, at least theoretically, where, where, where it is. The real question people have started to ask on a regular basis, people like Bill Browder have mm. pioneered this, is yes. can we not unfreeze the Russian state assets and give those assets to Ukraine. Right. Because that is essentially the start of reparations, isn't it, for what Russia's done? In fact, David Cameron suggested this at the Munich Security Conference yes. a couple of weeks ago. And how likely is that to be possible then? Well, it's certainly possible because all it requires is governments to pass laws to do it. However, there is, of course, the issue of, well, you're now interfering with property rights potentially, and even states have yes. rights in this regard. Right. If you tinker with this, do you therefore pull on the thread and everything comes undone? I don't think so. I think on this kind of basis, you can pass discrete laws that can easily target aggressors in this way, yeah. and you can use that state money, certainly, a bit more difficult in, in the personal uh, status, uh, to actually help the victims of the war. So that's quite a slippery slope, though, isn't it? Because if you actually go all that way to taking and, and basically seizing the assets of a sovereign nation, does it not mean that they could technically seize your assets? if they wished, for example, presumably not in Russia, but there might be British assets somewhere in Ukraine or uh, in, in some part of a country not, not a million miles from Ukraine. Yeah, theoretically. But again, as you've just pointed out, the, the likelihood of much being uh, accessible to these people is, is very uh, limited. Right. So, it, you know, you've got to pick your, your targets carefully. But the, the reality is the Russians have frozen themselves out of the global financial market because of what they've yeah. done. And the only question is whether we're going to unfreeze it ourselves and use that money to help Ukraine 
or whether the money's just going to sit there doing nothing. Right. But they still have access to economic markets via the Middle East, don't they? Because they go through Dubai. I mean, I know that... I mean, I think... Uh, who was it that flew back through Dubai? I think it was Tucker Carlson. Ended up flying from Moscow to Dubai and then took part in a sort of a conference there because, apart from anything else, it was one of the few ways he could get back to America because there are no direct flights. But there's still contact between the UAE and Russia. Well, not just the UAE. You've got India is still buying Russian oil. You've mm. got China doing deals with Russia. There's a great swathe of countries yep. uh, who are still trading with Russia and ignoring Western sanctions. Yeah and you know, not, not fulfilling that part of it. And that's, of course, why the Russian economy has not collapsed, basically, yes. because it's sanctions busting through the back door. And I'm told they've also got some quite good sort of uh, streams of income coming from various different oil fields, gas fields, and even some of the properties that they're kind of occupying in Ukraine. Well, I think that's probably correct. And part of what the Russians have done in Ukraine is steal things. Now, they've stolen people because right. they've kidnapped people. They've also stolen um, goods and they've stolen crops and whatever else they can do in order to help their own economy in that way. Yes. So when will this be resolved, do you think, this, the, the missing money or the, 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 the confiscated money, if you like? When will there be a, a ruling on that? Well, I think on the state side, I think countries are beginning to get their acts together. And I would be surprised if in the next six months we did not see some kind of uniform law being passed, at least in Western right. countries, saying that money is now ours. On the individual level, on Abramovich, for example, that is very unclear because you're into the realm of, well, it's his money, even if it's frozen, even yeah. if he promised it, how do we get it out? How do we do that? And, and that's it, a much more difficult... And if it part. does go to Kiev, who actually gets it? Does it go to Zelensky? Does it go to some well, shadowy group? I mean, right. who gets it? Well, it won't go to Zelensky, of course. It'll go to um, the government itself. And the foundation, it, the foundation that's handling that Abramovich money will be responsible for making sure it gets into the right places rather than in yeah. to any diversions that might take it away from the victims, which yes. is what it's supposed to be funding. Fascinating stuff. Well, we'll have to get you back once we know exactly what's happened to it. Uh, Dr Anna Mendoza, thank you very much indeed from the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Up next, the plane hijacker giving talks in Britain and the most miserable nation on earth. It's not Britain. Believe it or not, there's plumped somewhere worse than this. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. The panel have returned, Emma, Henry and Ryan. They're all here and I'm going to treat you um, to what can only be described as one of the cheesiest interviews I think I've ever seen. Uh, this is Rishi Sunak and, and Mrs Sunak who are collectively worth... Now, everyone today has been saying 700 million. Apparently they lost a couple of hundred million last year. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of a stock um, problem and so it's only 500 million now. And when you say that, it's like 200 million has disappeared from the Sunak coffers. Um, but here they are. They gave an interview to Grazia magazine, which is, I guess, how would you describe Grazia? I mean, you, you know well, I've written to them lots. It's um, a sort of a high-end, yeah, quite nothing. posh, glossy women's magazine. Uh, yeah, it is posh. It's not it's not Harper's Bazaar or anything, but right. it's definitely it's sort of at the upper end of the of the women's yeah. magazine. I mean, you could sit in a sort of, you know, airport lounge feeling quite good about reading. With Grazia, yeah, yes, definitely. Yes, you could go, look at me, I've got Grazia. Well, well here's, it's called Grazia. Yeah, well, here's R Rishi and, and Mrs Rishi talking about their home life together, making beds. Definitely Rishi. That is not your strong point. No, no, no. Uh, I'm not a morning person. No, that's fair. Sure, but you also just don't like making the bed. I mean, it bugs me, so I actually sometimes come up back into the flat from the office after we've all left to make the bed. Yes, because it's one of his special skills. One of his made. special skills, when we were studying, I used to actually eat in my bed. And Rishi would come home to my, where, where I lived. Sometimes there would be plates in my bed. Yeah, that's <laughs> disgusting. Not anymore. I'm not the most organised person yeah. compared to Rishi. <laughs> I just found myself thinking, why have they done that? You, you can tell there's an election not that far away. That, yeah. That's the thing. And um, I think the, one of the reasons I understand that they've gone with Grazia to do an interview like this mm. is not their... Um, not the Gratia sales for physical copies, but they have an, a, a tremendous TikTok following. Okay. So they think they can get through to another audience. Yeah. Well, they can, but then when they see it, they'll go. But that was skating a that? bit close to the bone. So he was saying about, you know, he's really anal about making yeah. the bed. So he would come up from downstairs from the office and I, go I'm back not up sure to I the I'm not sure I believe flat. that. Do you believe that? No, no, not really. And also, look, they've got 500, 700 million. Yeah. Why don't they? I'm do, I don't care about their domestic juggle. Who the hell they manage the household? Just get a housekeeper and do yes. the best. Someone will do the best for you. But also that conversation, it just went down that like route of like she needed to stop. She yes. was saying when I was studying and right. I'd be in bed and I'd be eating and yeah. then he would find plates in the bed and you can hear them. All the advisors going, no, 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 no. stop. That's you right. guys weren't because married. Also, he shouldn't have been coming yeah. down to your flat. What was going? Like, well, they just... saw, she almost corrected herself. Didn't she? Yeah. It sounded like they lived together and it was her room. And he would come in and it find her going... eating in the bed and suddenly he was like, oh, uh, uh, when he used to come and visit me. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know, just why do they bother? I mean, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, one, you know, this was apparently done for International Women's Day and I get that it's progressive that he does the bed and everything, but he was, he was basically at one point sort of attacking his wife for not being a good enough homemaker or getting yeah. close to that territory. Right. And but being also, disgusting. Do we really need... He actually said she was disgusting. Do we really yeah. need politicians? Yeah, he said she was yeah. disgusting on International Women's Day. <laughs> well, he did, he... And also, he's the Prime Minister. What's he doing going upstairs and making the bed? Yeah. Like, I mean, do we so need many... politicians to do this, right? Like, fine, if you're one of the politicians like would... Boris Johnson who does have that connection with people, Brilliant, that's amazing. Right. But like, who, who are the voters out there who are thinking, well, I mean, like, things are pretty terrible and I'm not keen on the government, but man, if I had an insight into Rishi Sunak's yeah. domestic arrangement. But this is exactly like, do you remember David Cameron in the kitchen yeah. at number 10? Right. And did After that they kind had it of completely redesigned. Yeah, and him and Sam Cam, they did this kind yeah. of interview, and it must have been in the run-up to an election, and they were trying to show that he was great with cooking just a simple pasta, yes. fettuccine dish, whatever, right. for the kids. And she says the same thing in the interview. She talks about how uh, 
he will he'll rustle it's up something a on a Sunday egg. morning. A He's great at breakfast. Ed Miliband got also got caught with that um, because they did a photo shoot in this tiny he had kitchen, two ovens. and it turned out it wasn't his kitchen. That's right. It was his, and, and one of his one, one of his friends in the media was like, "Oh, it's a functional kitchenette off the just for snacks." And it's like, <laughs> what? I love yeah, it. I know. <laughs> well, well, don't worry, because we've got another clip. This one's about their parenting skills. Oh, yeah. Check this out. I'm stricter when it comes to things related to school, like getting their homework done, making sure um, uh, they just... are reading, uh, making sure that anything related to school is is, is done well. Um, but in everything, everything else, else, I'm stricter. I'm relaxed. I can't see him being strict at all, can you? These are, these are really cringeworthy. I remember going back to the <laughs> mid... mid, mid 2000s, there was an interview with uh, Tony Blair and Cherie. And yeah. it was, they're flying, the interview was done on a plane as they're flying from one uh, event to the other. And it was all a bit nudge, nudge, wink, wink, yeah. shall we join the Mile High Club? And that was the, the headline. Oh. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the, the depths of it, they'll go to, you know, to catch a, catch yeah, a few just, boats. You don't want to know about that, do you? No. I mean, it was like when they announced that, um, that was it Leo had been conceived at Balmoral. Oh, that was awful. And you just go, no, I don't want to think about that. Yeah. It was I mean, cold. No. It, was, it was, you know, it was September. It, it was, it was <laughs> yeah, and I know the, the weather Royal, was House, turning. Royal Household can be probably very windy and cold, but still, I just don't want to think about Tony Blair and Cherie having sex, thanks. It's just not for me. Or them. And I don't want to think about their parenting. I don't care. No, How about I don't. you steward the bloody economy and sort the country out, stop the boats, you know, do all the things you said, and instead of, you know... I think it does actually rubbish. undermine him. It's kind of, you know, he should be he should be being Prime Minister. We are kind of in a crisis at the moment. Yeah. And he just, I think that's of, fair. He just sat there looking a little bit... Um, uh, who wants this? Unknown. Also, I, they're I so happy, aren't they? have ever been a Prime Minister that this works for. No. Right? Like, I can't think of a single one... Like as a, you know, again, some people they do they like they do have a better connection with the voters than others. Yeah, that's fine. But I can't think of a single politician who's actually had their image like changed for the better yes. by doing one of these interviews. Because yeah. fundamentally, one everyone thinks it's fake because yeah. of course it's fake. You've had grats yeah, year out. They will have you know normally if they do an interview they'll dress you first, right? Yeah. Like, but second, no one cares. No one, no one, no. no one is going to go to the voting booth and be like, "Well, you know, the cost of living crisis is biting. I can't get a place in my local no. hospital." But, but you know, they were, they were. A but they look couple, very happy they? together. Yeah. Also, they are, yeah. and I don't like to say about how much money they have because it shouldn't be an issue. But with them, it is because they're so rich. They're so that, wealthy. You know, the idea that they're but life is pretending easy. to be the same as everybody else. Oh, I make the bed and. But at this point, you're just thinking you're away. making bad decisions, mate. Like, yeah. if you're worth £500 million pounds and you're making your own bed, like, yeah. why are you in charge know, of the economy? That's what I mean. Why I'm are you in charge of the economy? Well, Without got being the final... misery guts, it genuinely yeah. does undermine him. He shouldn't yeah. be kind of talking about this stuff. He should actually be doing yeah. stuff about real things. I know. Maybe we'll get the, the kids talking before the end of the election campaign. This is the final one. This is them, I think, talking about their hobbies. I do. I wish. You wish. But... I also have more more time and flexibility. Um, and for me, exercise is everything from walking Nova, which I love, to taking a spin class. Um, and I'm just running once a week, and that's it. Yeah, well, I, I you, you, it's not twice a week, is it? We used to go a lot together. Yeah. That's yeah. the good old days. But we both love it. That's you again? Yeah, um, I, I, I've oh, always enjoyed you it. You like reading a lot. Yeah. I'm, too, exa I'm too exhausted when I get home at the end of every day. So I watch an episode of Friends when they go to bed. <laughs> And then it sounds like they're talking to each other sort of for the first time that day. Doesn't That's it? not how married couples talk. No. We'll do that again. Yeah, you'll be out running every day very, very soon, mate. You'll yeah. have loads of time to go to spin classes with Akshata. I know. Meanwhile, on the subject of extremism, Ryan and I were talking about this just a little while ago, you know, the definition of extremism. Here's a story for you. A Palestinian woman who hijacked two planes and claimed that Hamas militants who carried out October the 7th attacks were freedom fighters is giving a talk in the UK on Friday. Just... <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm, st I'm staggered that anyone... Her name who, is uh, Lena who Khaled. Can, who can hijack two planes um, should be given a, a platform in this country. Yeah. And, uh, and again, it brings into question, you know, this by association, do you do you crack down on, on the groups? So, uh, you know, right. Give, give and also, in this, a, in this a online world in which we live, I mean, she's not actually coming here. She's going to appear via video link uh, at a fundraiser hosted by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign somewhere in Birmingham, I think. But, you know, how do you stop... People being hate preachers online. Well, we know that imams have, you know, almost impunity in mm. this country, and yeah. all this stuff about the new extremism powers are going to occur. just use the powers you've got. Yeah, right. We know who people, you know, we know the people who are preaching dangerous, hateful speech, and 
awful doctrine. Just, just in, in Yeah, but can you physically stop somebody from doing a oh. speech online? I don't think you can stop them doing a speech online. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are... The problem is... No, what you can do, though, is you can do something about the Palestine, Palestine Solidarity campaign, yes. right? Like, you know, no, if I'm going to... If I want to set up a Zoom link to some fascist imam, can you physically stop me without right. the Great Firewall of China? Like, no. But what you can do is you can be like, right, you as an organisation have invited a convicted terrorist yes. to give a speech. That's unlawful or illegal, if it is, or you make it so, and then you punish them. So then so that's you what close you... them down. Yeah, you know, they're, what they're doing is they're revealing their true colours. You know, yeah. they're called the Solidarity Campaign. They dress themselves up when they choose to, as we're all about, you know, we're on the side of the civilians and the oppressed. But then they go and, you know, there are lots of people you can talk to about Gaza uh, from a Gazan perspective who have not committed terrorist yeah. offences. Right. But the problem, of course, again, is will the police play along? Or will the police go, well, you know, you know, might say they hijacked a plane, but did they really, you know how they like to kind of dismiss the word jihad? They don't like to, to identify Hamas headbands because they might not really be Hamas. You know, they're not really... I imagine from their point of view, they're going to say, well, actually, well, let's monitor the video. Let's yeah, see what she yeah. says. Our experts, then, yeah. will, our experts will analyse yeah. it and we'll yeah. work out that actually let's, it's... From possible. the Muslim Council of Britain, who are on the list, very possibly. Yeah, let's do a scoping exercise to find out whether any crime has actually been committed. And yeah. then, finally, you might get a decision been made. But by, by then, the the, uh, the imagery... The and, damage uh, and, has been done. Uh, yeah, exactly. The recruitment sergeant has already been in the building. Let's talk about uh, this ridiculous study which I saw today, how the most miserable country in the world apparently is Uzbekistan, but Britain second. I mean, if you're going to do it, at least make it first, you know. This is appalling, isn't, isn't it? it? So yeah. the demo, the, there's a sort of the information, demographic information, included stuff like our diet, yes. which apparently is appalling. The this is coming from a US-based think tank. Smartphone use. Right. Um, I like the places that were fabulous, you know, the top five places yes. to live that were really, really happy. What were they? Well, the like, Dominican Panama, Republic, Dominican Sri Lanka, Republic. Tanzania, Panama and Malaysia. I wanted to go to all of them, in, just anywhere but here. <laughs> it makes you question the methodology a little yeah. bit, though. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong, I know things are bad in this country and I'm sure it's perfectly possible to have a happy life in the Dominican Republic. It's, in fact, a very well-run country. But, like, come on. Like, it's a, it's, it's it's entirely, a holiday destination. It's entirely... It? It's entirely so, like, a lot of this stuff, it's, it's very subjective. It's very subjective. Like, yeah. you're, you're not, you've not really got any way of controlling for it. Yeah. And then they speculate about the reasons, right? So, like, oh, well, maybe it's because of smartphones. But yeah. we don't see in the story any kind of methodology for how they no. actually control But these people, I mean, they're always trying to find some kind of index, aren't they? Sapien Labs, I've never heard of them. They said they assessed 50,000 respondents across 71 countries with 11 new countries added for 2023. Um, and it's all about well-being. Which but is I one of those words. Like, what does it even mean? Well, I wrote a book. <laughs> my Did you? There we go. Oh, my fourth, you. My well, fourth then you're the expert. Book was actually well, called you're... Wellbeing. So well, then you you're can, the expert. You can do one. No, um, no listen, well, then you tell me what it is. I do think what there's something mean? particularly miserable. Well, mental and physical well-being, health. Um, I do think there's something particularly miserable about Britain at the moment. I don't know whether we're second. I don't know whether we're as bad or as good as Uzbekistan. But you often see people in, in terrible, you know, really war-torn countries like Ukraine, and they just, they seem to have a spirit inside, and they seem to yeah. be happy and have something to keep them going, whereas... Nationalism, maybe. Britain, yeah, but Britain at the moment feels, yeah, apologetic. It feels kind of, you know, beaten down. It feels poor. It doesn't feel like a very happy place to live. But surely you need to live in a several of these countries to make well, a judgment. I mean, here's the bottom, the bottom five are Tajikistan, Brazil, South Africa... The UK and Uzbekistan. South Sorry, Africa's wonderful. No, no, the odd one out. No, I mean, no, South, but this is the weird thing. Well, right? so are, you saying that we, really... are you saying that we underpolled South Africa? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But like, South Africa has a non-functioning economy. Exactly. It has, its its national grid is collapsing. Yeah. It has an AIDS epidemic. Yeah. It's the murder capital I'm sure of the if world. You live... It's the rape capital. I'm sure if you live world. in one of the nice <laughs> gated communities of Cape, Cape Town, Cape Town, yeah, it's quite pleasant. I, I know, know lots of happy people live there. for a couple of bottles of wine every so often. But if you're in a shanty town. Outside Johannesburg, I don't think you're having a great time. But then you're probably harder for some random US based uh, think tank to talk to. Right? Yeah, like, exactly right. The, and then the they reason. reckon that impoverished, I mean, I smell the, the wokists on this, by the way. Oh. Impoverished African and Latin American countries scored the highest. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would. Apart from Brazil, which is a, a, a down the bottom, but Brazil's supposed to be one of those very. I've never been to Brazil. Mm. I've always wanted to go because it's meant to be a very happy place. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was happy. You I know. thought everyone danced around in green and yellow. Rate. It does have a high murder rate, but you know. You'd think I, I, get a bit over exuberant. I think, I think it's one of those like rich and poor, like, yeah, the coastal exactly. areas and so on are very like rigorously policed and they're very. Here's important. one. Here's, yeah. here's this would be, could be your next book. The report found that in English speaking countries in the West, younger people under the age of 35 saw the biggest decline in mental well being. 
Yeah. Both well, during is... and after the pandemic. Well, we know that. People got, I mean, and people are addicted to their screens and they're, yeah. you know, socially isolated and not interacting with each yeah. other and right. terrified of doing anything. You can't even flirt with someone or put your hand on their no. bottom in a wine bar anymore. You well, did you see anything. that thing from America, of the, the, the VJ Day kiss, which has been sort of outlawed, but they've, they've finally pulled it back from the brink. Well, where's oh, the sorry, fun? Yeah. Well, exactly right. Imagine kissing somebody that you never met before because war had actually been finished and you were now at peace and you weren't going to be bombed to death by the Japanese. Um, final one for, for this bit. Um, Peter Mandelson appeared on Times Radio, uh, as he does, I think, every week after <laughs> winning an election. Uh, he's apparently got some advice for Keir Starmer. Lose some weight. I was quite surprised yeah. that he said that. Actually, I mean, yeah. I think you can. I think Peter Manderson can hand out general advice, and you know, to uh, Keir Starmer on strategy, you know, where he's going wrong and where, what he's doing right. But actually, saying to lose some weight, it, I mean, he's not. He's not that. He's not. He's not big or fat. He's, you know, he's not like, really. And he plays no, a bit of football. Doesn't he plays he? once a week. Yeah, he plays five aside. Uh, I was out with him in Reading a few yeah. weeks ago. Look. He looks perfectly, like he could probably healthy. do a bit of jogging without getting yeah, out of breath. Yeah, absolutely. But Mandelson, of course, is the arch image, image maker. I first met Peter Mandelson so many years ago, and I'm going to tell you. Um, he was sitting in the office of the, uh, the Sunday People's editor, a guy called Bill Haggerty, and he had a moustache. <coughs> and I swear to God, uh, he had a different accent, completely different. And he reinvented himself as this kind of raffish, you know, rather posh North London boy. Um, and very well street. dressed. The guacamole thing is, is apocryphal, apparently. Um, but suddenly became very well dressed and was surrounded himself with very wealthy people, you know, people that could lend him money for a nice house in London and all of that. Yeah. And he completely reinvented himself because when he had the moustache, he looked ridiculous. And he wrote a column in those days for Sunday People, which now I presume he wouldn't clean his shoes with. That's so funny. You know. But also, 2019, Boris having a few extra pounds, more than a few yeah. extra pounds, it didn't really hurt him, did it? I mean, no. I don't think that losing the weight is going to I think Starmer will always be bland his chances. and yeah. uninteresting. Get a character, well, maybe, I, yeah. but lose weight. I think weight. generally the sign is, the, the evidence is that, like, more attractive candidates generally perform better, which is exactly what you'd expect, yeah. because that's just, like, life, yes. basically. But Starmer, like, again... Starmer's going to win anyway, mm. right? Like, like he doesn't need Peter Mandelson's advice. And if you look at New Labour, yeah, did the image stuff help? Probably. Yeah. But it was the Conservatives in '97 who lost that election. I think it was the also nation. the age thing with Tony Blair because yeah. suddenly people were looking at him and going, "Oh wow, somebody with young children in Downing Street—that's quite cool." Yeah. In the same way that Obama did that, you know, when people looked at Obama's young I think some of these spin family, doctors, that was quite they, an attractive thing to see. They take too much credit. I think they, they, some of the spin doctors they get high yeah. on their own supply a little bit, and then they they're like, "Nope, this was all me. This was all my genius for messaging." Yeah. It's like. Um, no, like you helped. You helped. <laughs> well, considering that he had to resign, I think did he not twice I, from the know. Labour government because of sort of you know infractions that he may or may not have committed. Um, you know, it was a bit embarrassing, really. So I mean, and he I should know better. I think Keir Starmer looks kind of like a normal bloke, whereas I think Rishi Shunak is a bit too slick for voters. A little bit yes. too, you know, he's very, very thin and in shape and kind of disciplined and, and shiny. Yeah. Well, there's because a bit of that interview where he talks where about he kind don't of being, wear all, the... being all over what the kids eat and yeah. vegetables one day and, you know, eggs another day. It's like, really? Could, I think that most people in the members of the public could see themselves going having a pint with Keir Starmer. Yeah. You know, yeah. just to... Apart from just... that bloke in Bath, obviously. No, absolutely. Yeah, pub. exactly. Yeah. Get out of my pub. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, we've got more to do. We've got to have a look at some of the morning papers as well. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, we'll look at why electric cars pollute more than petrol ones do, amazingly. And, of course, as I said, it's the stories from tomorrow's papers. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The world of woke. Imagine my surprise. I woke this morning to two news stories about electric cars, and neither one of them was very good news for the eco-nutters. We all know that the gloss has been falling off EVs, as they're known, for the last year. We've all seen that the rise in sales is very much a bubble produced by companies buying fleets of cars following tax incentives being offered by the government to shift them. And I've also told you recently of how the Advertising Standards Authority has warned manufacturers not to sell or market EVs as emissions-free because it simply isn't true not least because of abuse of the CO2 dumped into the atmosphere to create the electricity used at charging points up and down the country. So the big question is, has the electric car bubble burst? Well, I hate to say I told you so, but I'm afraid it looks like I was right again. It has gone positively belly up. Consider the latest statistics which show that private buyers are disappearing. Sales to ordinary drivers have plunged by a fifth from the same time last year, as the government's now removed tax breaks unless you're buying one on behalf of a company. And while new battery sales have risen slightly, these are mostly covered by car rental companies and other corporate buyers. On top of that, there's a new report out from America which claims that electric cars might actually give out more emissions than modern petrol vehicles. It's not just the horrendous carbon footprint associated with the mining of minerals around the world to get the necessary components for the batteries. It's not just the use of child labour to mine those minerals. It's not just the fossil fuels that powered the factories that make the cars. And it's not just the transportation of the finished vehicles to market. It's not just all of that, but all of that doesn't exactly help. No, the new report originates from the US Virginia University of Virginia Tech and is published recently in the Wall Street Journal. And it shocked the industry by claiming something previously unheard of. A study found that because electric vehicles are 30% heavier on average than petrol-powered ones, the brakes and tyres wear out faster and cause tiny, often toxic particles to be released into the atmosphere. Of course, if you've been watching and listening to this show for a while, you'll know that I've been suggesting this could be a problem for years. EV batteries weigh about 453 kilograms and can result in tyre emissions which are 400 times worse than cars with exhaust pipe emissions, which rather makes a mockery of the state can't claim that you less charges extend everyone's life by making the air cleaner. And all that is before you measure just how much damage these heavy vehicles are doing to the roads, creating deeper and wider potholes quicker. All in all, it's another confirmation that green subsidies have driven a false level of sales and a completely disingenuous picture of demand. Now that people are starting to see through the con, they expect to see the sales disappear altogether. 
the world of woke. So much for the electric car. We were talking about food. Panel is still here. Uh, story in the Sun, guys. It says um, bangers should be off the menu, but eat more steak. This doesn't come as any great surprise to anyone who knows anything about processed food, I suppose. But this is coming from somebody uh, being giving an interview to the Times. I think it was a study that was done uh, by Lauren Southern of London Food Therapy. I don't know who they are, but yeah. you've got to be pretty stupid if you think you can eat sausages every day. Um, Absolutely. And uh, uh, Boris Johnson was even talking about this um, at the weekend. Mm. He was talking about how this... You know, the, 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 stick to the basic ingredients yeah. and make that the main part of your diet. And obviously, treat yourself now and then. Yes. But you, have to, you, know, you just have to be really, really careful talking about the whole obesity problem, how it's affecting the, the NHS. Um, the longer people are off work, the, you know, the, the fact that they're not in work, right. and the economy's not growing, it's not helping productivity, all these things come into it. So that's why it's obviously really important, that's what they're it's trying to say, is actually make sure you have a healthy-ish diet. Yes. I do think it's unhelpful, though, when she comes in and says, eat red meat once every two weeks. Yes. Right? Because you can make a really sensible argument to people about making substitutions, you know, instead of buying store-bought burgers, just buy lean mints and make burgers yourself. Yeah. Like, there's loads of really good advice. And then if you come into it and you're like, and actually you should only eat this stuff one, like, loads of people are just going to switch off. Mm. Because, like, that is an absurd demand to make. Yes. And it completely buries the really sensible adjustment advice that I think you can get out of things like this. Emma, you're the expert on this as well. Well, no. I mean, she's saying very obvious things, and I completely agree with Henry. What, what she's saying is ultra-processed food is really bad for yeah. you. And we know that things like sausages, you don't know what's in them if they're shoved in. But if you're eating, you know, expensive, high-class orga organic meat from, a lead, from an excellent butcher, then, of course, it's going to be good stuff. Yeah. You know, get buy mints and make burgers. They're yes. lovely and make, make them at home. Well, you know, whatever. once again, I've discovered this happened once near, near here at Borough Market Restaurant. I went and had a burger once for lunch and they told me oh, we, I, they said how do you want it I said it medium rare and they went we can't do that and I said why not and they said well because um, we're only allowed to serve them medium and I said says who and I went Southwark Council and I went what are you talking about <laughs> and it turns out there's a rule that if you buy in burgers this is how you know and I said well I'm never coming back here it was an expensive restaurant I mean, you should be making your own burgers if you're buying them in I'm not coming back yeah um, and then it happened again uh, on Friday night I was out uh, with some colleagues and uh, they said the same thing. Uh, only this time they said they could only serve it medium well. For the, and again, I said, this is, a, this is a proper restaurant. You should have proper burgers that you're making in the kitchen. If you're not doing that, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. So it's quite a rip-off what's, what's going on. You do find out all sorts of yeah. odd things in restaurants when you say, can I have it this way? Oh, no, sorry. And you realise that it's all just being bought it's, in. Yeah, exactly. Like, almost like a frozen tray mm. in an airline. You know, yeah. it's just, yeah. Especially because burgers, again, is incredible. Like, a rest for a restaurant not to be making a burger. Yeah. Which is literally, what, a bit of egg. What else are, well, you just think, what else pepper. are they not making? Yeah, what precisely. And I actually said to them, I said, but you can serve me some steak tartare. Oh, yeah, that's fine, because we make that here. It's sort of bonkers. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Um, Palace's anger at Kate Date Clanger. This is a uh, front page of the Metro. Ministry of Defence apparently dropped... Um... This, this is really strange. The, the, the event is Troop in the Colour, yeah. um, for first week of June. And the Ministry of Defence put out on, their, on, on one of their websites saying that... Uh, Oh, buy some tickets, £15. We're pounds. expecting the princess of Yeah. It's a bit of a schoolboy error, isn't uh, it? And one of the key things about having covered royals in the past is that it's the palace who, the, right. who give the yes or the no about whether anyone's turning up. And, mm. it, you know, they make a big formal announcement and uh, it goes through the court circular and all these kind of things. Um, and then this time, they jump, they totally jump the gun. Now, it seems like she probably is likely to yeah. go because all senior royals do go. But while she's under this sort of health predicament, right. um, they, they've got to tread very carefully. Well, isn't there a security implication as well? You shouldn't be giving the old terrorist as much of a heads up, should you? Uh, exactly. I love all that. that. I love yeah. the court circular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's sort of obvious if they've already said that she'll be back in, you know, on, on duty, public duties by Easter, it does seem fair enough to announce something in June. But you're right, they shouldn't have right. announced it. it. It does also seem like a bit of a security risk to say... You, would think. you can't release details and of the World Diary. It's the Ministry of Defence who are breaching security. I mean, they're the guys that are supposed to be watching it's over probably us. an over-enthusiastic kind of, you know, work experience person thinking... Working from home. This is great. This will sell loads of tickets. Yes. Writing mm. up a lovely, shiny press release and releasing it. Well, speaking of lots of tickets, what about this? £450 cash back in the sun. Um, this has got your name on it, Ryan, yes. so you can be the first to tell us what it means. So this is... Um, we fully expect um, Jeremy Hunt to announce tomorrow that um, national insurance um, will be cut again. This is the second uh, cut in about six months or so. Um, again, it will be £450 cash back to uh, the average worker on £35,000 
uh, a year. Right. And that's the, the main, unless he's got some rabbit out the hat that no one's quite got tonight, um, that that's going to be the, one of the main sort of linchpins of, of this budget, whether it's going to change the dial or not. But he's got to come up with the ways to pay for it. Yeah. So he's either going to have to raise, he's going to have to raise some taxes or he's going to have to squeeze public spending um, along the way. It seems like the non-DOM regime that um, Labour have talked about that's going to try and raise a lot of money, that is at risk. And it looks like that could that could go, that could face a massive mm. revamp uh, tomorrow. So that could raise up to £3.6 billion. And when you're scrambling around for money, yeah. that's a lot of money. And I wonder if he's going to use any of it for this other story over there, £132,000 offer to end the NHS strike and for consultants. Consultants have been on strike for as long as junior doctors have. Uh, and they were apparently offered something like 21% and turned it down. So God knows how much they're going to actually finally accept. And they're on a pretty good salary. They already. really I are. Just think, I just think junior doctors and consultants need to get back to work. Yeah, we they do. We know what a state the NHS is in. If this carries on, well, I mean, the election's pretty much already lost, but it's not a great way for the yeah. <laughs> government in power to go into an election, is it, with, you know, an almost non-functioning NHS? And the government's in a bind as well, because a lot of the health unions have already settled, right? right. And those unions look like mugs if the really militant unions that hold out for insane amounts yeah. then get, the, get yeah, that right. settlement. So there's a danger also, either that the other unions walk back out yeah. or at least next year they're thinking, right, we're not going to be played for fools again. Well, I like, think, we yeah. want I think everyone who, who, who expects the unions to calm down once Labour gets in, the opposite will happen because they'll think Labour will give them even more. The thing that I find interesting about this spread is the dog. Um, he's got Jeremy Hunt's walking his dog. The dog looks absolutely terrified. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen it? Look at his eyes. His eyes are like staring out of his is head. Is that an XL bully? Well, I was going to ask it's, that. I don't think it is. He might need one. <laughs> I don't think it is. But the no, dog, but he looks like he's been the caught in the spot. does spot not look happy. It's been trained to, it looks like it's been trained to hate journalists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's seen one. What, you know like what? Jeremy Hunt looks really like exhausted <laughs> and tired. That's obviously like a 4 or 5 a.m. run, isn't it? Yeah. Just, just before sunrise. Yes. Um, but he doesn't look happy at all. Jeremy Hunt was um, in back to back meetings all last end of last week trying right. to find some money for, for the budget. Right. Friday morning, he's out for a 17 mile run. So, I mean, it's like 17 miles. I mean, yeah, he's doing the marathon. Is he in training? Oh, yeah, he's, he's I was going to say, yeah. he must be. Well, or just just running away. Well, look, they're both going to have. how he's raising the money. You can sponsor him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd like to, but unfortunately, I'm paying too much tax. Finally, we should mention Jeremy Hunt again, front page of the FT, meeting Prince uh, King Charles. I was, I was called that. King Charles, um, who's out and about. Still, um, I, I, can't, I thought he was on holiday. I think he comes back once a week for, right. for meetings and he's in Sandringham the rest of the time. Yeah. But um, it does seem that Buckingham Palace are very keen to get him out um, and actually seen that he's, mm. he's meeting people and, and, and got these meetings um, uh, every opportunity, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Camilla's flown away. Yeah. We don't know exactly where. There's talk of an Indian spa that she loves and right. there's talk of, I don't know, the, you know, the, um, the Caribbean. But... Um, I don't think the king's gone with her. No, it's not clear, is it? I mean, I don't suppose we're supposed to know. Normally, they would they would be quite happy to say she's gone to the Caribbean, but they don't seem to be saying it at the moment. She might just be hanging around in Gloucestershire. Yeah. But I think it's a good sign. It shows that his his treatment, whatever it is, is mm. going well. In that he's able to do he's he is being seen and he is able to have his meetings and yeah. things in between uh, weekly treatments. So. Sure. Very good. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, we have reached the end of the show, amazingly. It's gone very quickly, again. Uh, that's all from me tonight. You've been watching um, The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to all of my guests, uh, to Ryan, to Emma and to Henry as well. Um, I'll see you back here tomorrow at 8pm. The budget is, of course, going on tomorrow. I'm going to try not to bring you a very, very boring show about it, because it will be pretty boring. So we'll try and find lots of other interesting things to tell you about as well. It's only on Talk TV. Good night. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, son. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. 